Thank you. So I'm going to give you a talk on Grafter, remixing 3D printed machines. Um, this is a machine that we made with our software system called Grafter. And the interesting thing about this machine is that the person who modeled this has only recombined mechanisms that were actually modeled by other people into a new machine. And throughout this talk, I will explain you how that works. So in our software system, we look something like this. Here are three different uh, machines. The different colors represent different uh, authors, different source models. And the only thing the user does in a quick preview here is that he takes a mechanism out of one machine and uses the connect tool in order to rip it out of its original context and recombine it with the mechanisms inside of another machine. So I'm going to explain you this in more detail, but let's first have a bit of a look at the background of this work. So uh, for a long time, people have started to share things on repositories like Thingiverse. So at this point, there's like over a million models in Thingiverse. Um, and some elementary forms of remixing have started to happen as well. So people take shape of one model and they recombine it with shape of another model to make something new out of them. Uh, and the sharing of things is actually cool because it lets us reproduce the same models. But it only lets you reproduce the same models. So um, it's a bit like sending over a pre-compiled computer program. So like, you can do that and you can run it on your computer and it will actually execute again. But if you want to do something more with it, you would actually need to have access to the original source code. And ideally, you would need to have access at the level that you can actually kind of reuse it efficiently. So for example, for libraries. So if you look at it in a bit of a more historical perspective, um, right now people have started sharing these, uh, a lot of these models. Uh, this happened already for a while, but since the tech end is just kind of a joint that movement of creating 3D models. And that started way back in industry uh, with the sharing of industrial models. Now this is a timeline that you may not be super familiar with, but there is one that, that is certainly a little, little bit more kind of familiar to all of us, and that's the one on sharing software. So with software, we had roughly the same kind of uh, process. So we started back in industry, where people started to kind of share uh, computer programs. And in the late uh, 60s, McIlroy kind of raised this question of like, what would be the right thing to reuse? Um, later on, tech enthusiasts kind of joined that movement. Consumers uh, kind of are at this point also able to take computer programs, modify them for their needs, so they kind of create websites or something like that um, in a reasonable, easy way. Um, and that all kind of happened because we started to share more interesting functional units, like libraries. And the question that McIlroy asked back then in, in, in the late 60s is a question we've never really quite asked when it comes to fabrication. So like the question of what we should be resharing, is it these things or is it something else? And that's what we're trying to address in this talk. So um, if you look at the centrifuge we saw in the beginning, um, we made the centrifuge by taking something that holds test tubes in place, uh, taking a crank and a gearbox from another machine, and something to redirect that cranking. And the key question now is, how does one remix this together? How does one make something more interesting out of this? So uh, in order to understand this, the first thing we did is we started to look at common maker practice, like what people are doing right now. Um, so when we, we downloaded the four, 349 uh, models of the Thingiverse Remix Challenge, and we kind of investigated how these models have been remixed. So here's a nice example of one reasonably complicated remix that was made. And um, the different colors again refer to the different source models. And you see here that this green axle is fitting in that blue bearing. And it's only fitting because that person has kind of re changed the size of the dimension until it would fit properly. Now, in the example of our centrifuge, this would look something like this. So here are the mechanisms inside the centrifuge. And um, it seems to make sense like that. But if you look a little bit closer, it like, kind of breaks at all the points where different models uh, touch, where different colors kind of overlap. So let's focus on one specific one here. And this is like the green axle that we stuck inside that red gear. And uh, what you see is that it doesn't seem to make too much sense in this configuration. There's too much kind of margin around that axle. So, well, we could just do the same thing as what makers are doing, right? We just kind of adjust the diameter until it fits properly. Now, the problem with that is if you made it like roughly the same dimension or a little bit too big, it will get stuck. And if you made it too small, we end up having like a somewhat non-fitting gear as well, and it starts to kind of get wobbly and jam. So the only way to get this right is by uh, doing a series of iterations of tweaking and test printing until you get the exactly uh, right configuration. And this is, one way of doing it is what people are doing right now, but it's a very time consuming process and it takes a lot of resources. And not only do we have to do it for at one position, but we have to do it at all the positions where different models touch. So um, in the industry, this problem has actually been solved in a way. Like they solved it using standardization, which is 
great idea, right? If I take a, a part made by one manufacturer and I combine it with another part made by another manufacturer, I know that they're gonna fit again. So what about hobbyists? Why don't they follow the same standardization? So again, we downloaded uh, 324 models from Thingiverse and um, with the search their mechanism, and we kind of measured the actual and bearing dimensions that were in these, in these models. Um, and we counted all the dimensions that are shared by multiple models. And what we found here, so here's a histogram of the results, is that there is a lot of different uh, dimensions that are being used, but you see a bit of a cluster, somewhere around like two millimeters, and that's like for people who are in, into making this, like that, that there might be something there. So could these be actual standards? No. Well, oh, uh, ah, <laughs> I see. Well, a uh, closer inspection of these models reveals that indeed these are standards. These are screws and nuts and, and, and bearings that are kind of shared, made by industry and that are used in the models of makers. So, unless makers need to uh, make their models fit to standardized parts, they don't seem to adhere to standards. It's only when they actually have to kind of make things fit uh, that are standardized that they uh, follow the standards. So what can we do? We're still lost with this problem. Um, so let's, let's go back to where these models came from. So in, in the original configuration, each of these models have worked. They have been tested by a maker, they have been fabricated, and they have actually been uh, uh, doing their job, having performing them their, perform their functionality as a mechanism. <laughs> So the red geometry used to work just fine. Only when we inserted the green axle, we changed that. We made it into a configuration that didn't quite work. So why don't we just use the red axle wherever we touch red, red geometry, and the green axle wherever we touch the green geometry? Now, of course, that leads to some kind of points in between where we need to kind of cut and fuse the uh, axles together. So we chop inside the parts, and we kind of recombine them there together. So we argue that it's a bad idea to reuse parts, and instead we would propose to reuse mechanisms in an approach we call mechanism-based reuse. And we use this approach to create a large amount of different uh, remixes within the software system. So let's look at one of these examples, and it's the centrifuge we've seen before, because we start to understand that a little bit now, and uh, see how Graft can remix this, uh, this machine. So we start with these two models. Um, they are already loaded by the user, and we load that third model, so that bevel gear mechanism that we've seen before. So we use a simple search query, and there's the record player that we've seen before. And it's loaded into our software. Now the next thing we will need to do is we need to take a mechanism outside, out of that uh, record player. So we need to somehow select the mechanism in there. So let's do that as well. So I simply click on the gear, and I click on it again to extend that selection. Now, something happened in the hood. Somehow my software system understood that I wanted to select this mechanism here. So let's see how that happened. So the record player is built up from three different mechanisms. There's a turntable on top. This is an end effector. There is a bevel gear mechanism in between, which is this transmission mechanism. And then there's a crank on the, on the side to kind of crank the whole thing. And we actually only want to use a bevel gear mechanism in there. So what we do is we chop in the axles in between. Um, and we need to kind of select the mechanism that is, that is contained in, in, in between. And the way Grafter does that is it uses a model graph that is created using a process of semi-automatic annotation um, in order to find out how the different things work inside. So I'm going to quickly explain like, the, the structure of this graph and then later on I'll show you how we create these. So um, the pink nodes in here are the parts where different, model, different parts touch. Uh, the black nodes are the frame that holds the whole thing together and the white nodes are the input and the output of the machine. So when I, when I click on that big gear, um, thing Grafter does is like from that point in the, in the graph, it tries to find parts to the, to the black nodes, to the, the ground geometry. So you always need to have something that holds the mechanisms together and we need to have the combination of the two gears uh, in concert. And if I click one more time on that same gear, I extend the selection by adding uh, one more path to that ground. So that adds like that path on the bottom here. That is the gear in the bottom that you see there as well. And I can continue clicking, and then it will add like another path, but now all the ground is already selected, so it will go to one of these <coughs> white nodes, these in and output mechanisms. And the last click will select the entire ma machine in this case. So I've clicked twice and selected that, uh, that bevel gear mechanism. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it inside the siren, like the interaction you saw in the beginning of the presentation. And what you've noticed here is that there were these pink crosses showing up. And these pink crosses, they are kind of the snapping points where different mechanisms can be uh, recombined and, and, and uh, attached to each other. 
So they are also created based on the same monograph. So all of the points that are the last connection until we reach the frame, it holds the whole thing together. Um, these are points where some axle could be kind of connected to the, to the machine. So in this specific case, that is like the gear on the top, the gear on the side, and the one on the bottom. So these are all kind of the points where um, something could connect to the, to the mechanism. Um, and that's, that's how these were combined here. So the last thing Rafter does is it kind of fuses the mechanisms and merges the geometry together. So it creates like one new um, working machine. Now, in order to complete the centrifuge, we need to do one more thing. We need to add that tube holder on top. So let's do that as well. And it's the same approach that you've seen before. Select the tube holder and drag it to the machine. Now, you note here that like, um, when I try to connect this, it actually kind of removes all of the geometry that is constraining the mechanism to move around. So there is like space required around the tube holder in order to be uh, able to connect tubes there and, and spin around. Um, and it's only allowed to do that in these black nodes, in this, this, this uh, frame that holds the whole thing together. So there we go. We made this machine with uh, Grafter. Now, as I already kind of uh, told you before, like this all happened based on the on the monograph structure that we've seen before. So let's see how where that came from. So we need to teach Grafter. So here is an example of a <coughs> machine. It's a vice, and uh, this is what it's supposed to do. So we need to kind of get Grafter to understand that that is what this vice is doing. And in order to do that, um, we kind of create these these pink uh, interfaces that are like proxies for the actual geometry inside. And they describe, so they are the pink nodes in the monograph that we've seen before. So these are all the points where like different mechanisms touch. And we need to highlight these in the model and kind of indicate that this is the parts that uh, need to be included in the graph. So um, the nice thing of these is that they are all kind of centered around an axis of rotation. So uh, we, we wrote a little script that actually finds these axes of rotation inside the model and, um, and use that knowledge to then kind of create these uh, interfaces in place. So the only thing a user needs to do is like load the model with the axis of rotation in there and uh, use this interface selection tool to create cylinders inside that model and shapes inside that model that are kind of these, these interfaces inside. So we're going to label the gear there in the bottom. Um, and in three clicks, you actually kind of got a proxy for that gear that is now the interface that is going to be used in the model graph. So we repeat that for all of the different uh, interfaces. And the next thing you can do is you can start linking these together to actually kind of describe the mechanical functionality of the whole thing. So you select the gear and the gear next to it. And you use the link tool to kind of label them together as a mechanism. And you can give it a name if you want. Uh, and afterwards, like after you, did, after you did this like for all the mechanisms, you end up with this model graph that describes the functionality of this vice. And at that point, moment, you can start to kind of reuse it and recombine it into uh, other machines. So we did this for a bunch of models, like just to give a bit of a sense for how to mistakes. It still takes re reasonably long, and we could automate more steps in this. Uh, but it's already like you do this once per model, and at that moment, you can start to reuse this uh, multiple times. So it's not a really big investment up front to kind of make this work. So in order to evaluate our approach, we also did a, a user study. We evaluated Grafter by measuring how long it takes for users to remix machines with this uh, approach, and whether the objects can be printed without a further need for tweaking. So we recruited 12 participants, and uh, they were given an annotated uh, monograph with 15 annotated models. And uh, they all kind of re required up to 10 minutes of training in order to, um, in which they made the centrifuge in order to understand roughly what's going on here. So um, the results of this study show that um, all of our participants managed to actually make these remixes. Like they had a two-part remix that they were doing here. Uh, they finished a task in less than eight minutes, and on average, even less than five minutes. So they just kind of made one remix inside the system here. We actually had two different types of uh, models that we asked them to produce to see also if it was like depending on the model itself. So we had people making wire twists, people making bull winders. And um, a nice, uh, so the other side effect is that they actually managed to print this without, the models managed to print without further need for tweaking. So the models, the way they came out of graft are very immediately kind of ripe for our fabrication, if you will. So in conclusion, remixing allows users to make machines with little effort and tweaking. And Grafter is the first system to support this process. And the used abstraction of machines as a model graph forms a basis for more work in <coughs> space. 
Like it's a re relatively easy way to capture the functionality of the, of the, of the machine in a uh, lightweight data structure that can then be used for all kinds of other. So to come back to the initial question that we were asking, um, what McIlroy asked back in the late 60s, like what, what would be the right thing to reuse? Well, we think we should, as long as, as, long as it's about uh, making functional machines, we should be reusing mechanisms. And we developed Rafter as a software system to support this process. Thank you for your attention.